It's good to see everybody this morning. Miss Millie. It's always great to see these shining faces. We're getting ready to go up. It's time to praise God. Hey, yep, yep, yep. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And he has made us glad this morning. Hey, hey, hey. A shout out of praise deserving. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors and he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise I always got a big smile on my face But it's bigger because I went to the dentist this week Hallelujah! We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves Sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on the cross, then he rose up from the grave. And my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. Surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Yeah, we were the beggars, but now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, but now we're running free. And we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the best, but now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, but now we're free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. My soul rejoices because today, as every day, is another opportunity to give God my best. Have your way.
There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Because Jesus sees a light. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Because Jesus sees a lot. Oh, that's beautiful. If you know it, sing it with me. Praise the King. can be courageous there's a reason why the dead are made alive there's a reason why we share his resurrection because jesus is alive he's alive today forth in this house this is holy ground God we ask that you receive our praise this morning creating us a clean heart and renewing us a right spirit oh we're gonna sing this the grave could not ignore it when all of heaven's roaring hell where is your victory death where is your sting the world could not ignore it when all the saints are roaring hell where is your victory death where is your help me say the grave could not ignore it when all hell where is your victory the world could not ignore with all the saints on hell where is your victory death where is your sting yeah. let me say pray praise the king he is a reason praise the king he's alive When all of heaven's roaring, hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The world could not ignore it. When all the saints are roaring, hell, where is 
is your victory. Death will be one more time. Say the wave cannot it. When all the hell, where is your victory? The world cannot ignore. That's where is all staying for quick. seated in majesty for you are the risen king come on and put your hands together our God is great and greatly to be praised hallelujah It's been so long since I've been here, I forgot that that was my cue. Oh my goodness, it is back to be, it is so good to be back with you. So if you have not, um, <laughs> if, this is, if this is your first time this morning, the story is that we were all get up and like ready for fall and then I had a COVID exposure and so we did this weird thing when I preached on a television. We rolled it in here and that was really weird, but I was like, it's okay, I'll be back next week. And then I was out for another two weeks. And so it is so good to be back. It is so good to be physically with you. Um, I, was, I missed you so much. And we are gearing up for an amazing, amazing fall. So if you, we'll talk about this more at the end of the service. But y'all, we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. This service especially, we are going to move it outside to the pumpkin patch in October. Do y'all remember how beautiful it was last year? So you need to start praying for good weather now. <laughs> <laughs> because what made it beautiful is that it was 70 and crisp and cool and we're surrounded by beautiful pumpkins. And so we're going to have three or four weeks of good outdoor worship in the pumpkin patch starting the Sunday after the pumpkins arrive, which is the second Sunday of October. So put that on your calendar. Uh, spread the word. It's going to be a fantastic community celebration. We're so, so excited about it. Uh, folks, as we um, enter into this... Oh, connection cards. See, I've been gone for too long. I forgot. Connection cards. Uh, in the back, you can pick up a little card. If you've not been with us before, this is our way of keeping attendance, and it's also your way of telling us about questions or prayer requests or things that you want more information on. So you can put your name on it. Uh, you can check off areas that you might be interested in, and then you can write your question or your prayer request. Drop it in the clear box on your way out or during the greeting time, and if you write a question or something, we'll be back in touch with you sometime this week. As a word of warning, if you write something and we do not get in touch with you, it's because we can't read your handwriting. So on your email address or your phone number, just make sure to write it extra clear because I have sent a number of emails into the black hole of the internet <laughs> because I was one letter off on the email address. Uh, and so just keep writing your email address as clearly as you can and we will get back in touch with you. Uh, friends, it is a good, good day to be in the house of the Lord. I'm so glad to be here. I'm pumped, are you pumped? Are you excited to be at worship this morning? Uh, let's stand up and let's greet one another in the name of Christ.
good. We got one more coming up to join us. <laughs> Yay. Now we're complete. <laughs> so last week, do you remember we talked about the fruit of the Spirit? Do y'all remember something about that? How there's this tug of war going on inside us. There's the sinful nature pulling in one direction, but God's Spirit is pulling us in another direction. And there's proof that God is working in our lives when we see things like patience and joy and self-control and gentleness. Do you remember us talking about the fruit of the Spirit? And this is proof that God is working in our lives when we exhibit these beautiful things like being patient with each other and kind and having self-control, right? Yes, they're very healthy for you. Yeah, on cereal, they're really good too. Well, today, guess what? We're going to talk about the exact same Bible verse, but we're going to talk about it as a recipe. So I want to show you something very special. When my kiddos were little, they loved this uh, Bible called Salty's Kids Bible. And it was so neat because it had an audio tape that went with it. And a lot of the verses were put to song, and Salty would sing the song. So we're going to learn a song, but we're not going to sing it. We're just going to say the words. And I'm going to act it out as Salty tells us how all of these things can get mixed up in our heart and makes a really neat recipe. Okay, so what do I have here? Is this a mixing spoon? And is this a mixing bowl? And y'all are going to help me think about how we can work in the kitchen. You see, Miss Millie has her apron and my chef's hat. Okay, you ready? So this is the recipe song from Galatians 5. Gonna make a recipe. I just can't wait to start. It's not the kind you serve at meals. You make it in your heart. If you've ever tried it, you've got to have a taste. So come into the kitchen and we'll make a batch of praise. Now, what do you think we should add to our batch of praise? Well, first you take a cup of faith. There's the faith. And you stir it all around. And then you add some joy. And then you add some laughter. Can y'all laugh? <laughs> Yes, yes. Till you make, until it makes a bubbly sound. Mix it in with agape love till it begins to ring. Now here's the kicker. Pour it into a willing heart and serve it to our king. Do you like that? So what they're saying in this Bible song is when we combine the things of joy and laughter and faith and self-control, it's not only good for us, it's a way to praise God, okay? So can y'all be chefs someday and mix up some praise and laughter and gentleness in your home? And then you put it in your heart and then you serve it to God, okay? So let's go to God in prayer and ask him to help us be good chefs, okay? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to always want to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to be patient and kind and gentle and to have self-control. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we got another one. Give it up for Steven! <laughs> Who next? I see we got one here, one right there, one right here. What y'all want to do? <laughs> Just let me know. Talk to me after church. Let's hear it for the Encounter Band. <laughs> Always open for volunteers in the Encounter Band, all you musical people out there. All right, uh, so <laughs> y'all remember Galatians? This was like a long time ago. 
Um, what we're going to do, I was originally going to finish the sermon series on Galatians from home and just put it out online. Um, and two things convinced me to not do that. First of all, I don't know if y'all have ever lived with toddlers before, but like the noise level in a home with toddlers is not conducive to excellent recording. Um, and the second is that I, I really kind of want to finish this as a congregation. So we have a few more weeks before I start the October sermon series. When we move out to the pumpkin patch, it's going to start a, a brand new exciting sermon series about Westminster and the future and all that kind of stuff. We've got a few weeks before that. And so what I want to do is finish out the Galatian series together with you. And so we just, just think of it like we had a, a break in the middle of the, the series. We had this, this pause and now we're coming back to remind everyone where we were with this series, this book is one of Paul's feistiest books because he is irked. He's irked because he planted this church, preached to them the gospel. They received the Holy Spirit. And that is evidenced by the miracles that happened and the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that was growing within them. And then when Paul left to go plant other churches, teachers came behind him and did follow-up sermons. And these follow-up sermons went something like this. You believe in Jesus, and that's so wonderful. We're so happy for you. But in order to be a full member of the family of God, you're going to need to do something else. Namely, you're going to need to become circumcised and follow all of the Mosaic law so that you can actually be in the family of God. And of course, where these other preachers were coming from is that the, the conception of the family of God for the people of Israel was that God made a covenant with Israel when he called Abraham out of Ur and said, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and through you, the nations of the earth will be blessed. And in that making of a nation, in order to give them a sense of identity, there was a strict line in the sand between Jew and Gentile that was marked not only by belief, but was marked by clothing, by food, by behavior. It was marked by all kinds of things so that you knew if you were in or if you were out. And if you were in, you were a member of the family of God. And if you were out, you were not. And so understanding Jesus is the culmination of what God had done in Israel. And Jesus is an act of Israel's God in doing something for the world. These, these other teachers understood that maybe what God is doing is inviting everyone into that family of God established in, in Israel so that now all these Gentiles can become a part of this family. But of course, in order to do that, they're going to need to do all of these things. They're going to need to go through this ancient initiation rite of circumcision. They're going to need to start dressing differently and start eating differently. They're going to become Jews, which meant more than just religious belief, it meant lifestyle, meant culture, meant, meant ethnicity, meant a whole lot of things. Uh, the image I used early on is think of the difference you know when you see an Amish person, right? You know when you see an Amish person, you know when you see an Orthodox Jew, you know when um, a religious belief is linked to an entire lifestyle. And the teaching that was following up Paul is, you have Christ, great, now here's the rest of the message. And Paul writes back because he's furious, and what he says in the beginning is there is no other gospel. You had the gospel at the beginning, and what you're trying to do is add something on top. And not only is it not needed, it is actually detrimental because it is making you undervalue what you received in the first place. It is making you undervalue the gospel. There is no other gospel by which people are saved. And so he gives this argument very forcefully at the beginning. And then what happens for the next few chapters is he draws out scriptural arguments to support that contention. We, we suppose that what he's doing is responding to the sermons that have been preached to them. Because he spends a whole lot of time talking about Abraham, and we, we, we suppose that what he's doing is these sermons that have been preached to this church have been, because you want to be a part of the family of Abraham, therefore you need to do this. And so Paul's coming along and saying, no, 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 that's not what it's actually about. And so if you read through these passages, you see a whole lot of Paul drawing these analogies of, from Abraham, showing that Abraham received the promise through faith and not through the law. In fact, right immediately before the passage that we're about to read, he said that Abraham received the promise 430 years before the law came. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Abraham was made right by the law? No. It means that even at the very beginning, God was planting the seeds that the gift was to be given and received by trust, 
not by following a set of rules. And so that is the basic argument that has been laid out in this book until this point. And what the passage that I'm going to read to you this morning has two basic points. This is where we get one of the big turning points of, of the book. And this is where he, he summarizes, he, he kind of puts the final touch on his argument about the law. So this is Galatians 3, beginning with verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made, and it was ordained through the angels by a mediator. Now, a mediator, oh my gosh, I started reading too early. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we can keep going. But now, a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. This is actually where I meant to start. Here we go. Verse 21. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would have come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. I'm going to keep going to the second half of that in a second, but I want to pause right there. Now, in that translation, those words that are used, imprisoned, disciplinarian, those are overwhelmingly negative words. In the original Greek, they're not necessarily negative. That word disciplinarian was the word used for a teacher assigned to a young child from about age six to about age 14. So uh, from zero to six, they would be with a nurse in a nursery. Then from about six to 14, they would be under a pedagogue or a teacher. And this teacher would, would protect, would take them to school, would give rules, yes, would discipline, but all it was, it was not necessarily a negative term. I mean, some of you are out there, are, it, if you substitute the word disciplinarian for teacher, you have a very, very different image of who you're dealing with, right? But if you just say teacher, it's not necessarily that this person is beating you. It's that this person is setting limits, but also guiding you. And that's the word that is used to describe the, what the law was and what purpose the law served for the people of God for a time. So fundamentally, in this section... Paul has just finished saying, you don't need to follow all of the law. You don't need to get circumcised. You don't need any of that. And now what he's doing is before he moves on, he is making a very important point. And it's a point that's going to be nuanced throughout the rest of his book, throughout the rest of his work. And it's a point that we need to understand unless we're, if we're not going to just caricature him. And it's this, the law is not bad, right? The law is not an evil. The law is not even necessarily wrong. The law was something that was needed for a time, served a purpose for the people and for the family of God, and now with Christ we have moved on to something else. So think about that image of a young person. When you are young, you need rules. If you are raised without rules while you are young, it is not a benefit to you because rules help you know where to go and how to behave. I used to think rules were, I, I used to not like rules until I had a child, and then I realized how much we re need rules, right? You have to have rules growing up, and if you don't, it is not a sign of a loving parent, but it is a sign of a neglectful parent. And so this argument that Paul is making is that the law is not bad, it's just that the law was used for an earlier age. So the image that I gave you in the first sermon is the image of training wheels. And if you think about that, if you are riding on a bicycle and you've got training wheels on, they show you when you're shifting your balance too much to one side or the other that you're in danger of falling off. The purpose of the training wheels is to show you which way is straight and to catch you if you lean too much in one, one direction. So the training wheels are not showing you the wrong way. They're showing you the right way. They exist to catch you if you lean over. Now, suppose you were learning to ride a bike and you said, I can't wait for these training wheels to get off because then I can finally lean over as far as I want to. What's going to happen is as soon as those training wheels come off, you're going to face plant 
because that is not the way training wheels are supposed to work. Training wheels are supposed to work so that you can, you can develop the muscles and you can develop the feel for what it feels like when you go straight. Not a constraint on your freedom to lean over as far as you want to. Why is this important, friends? People have misunderstood Paul for 2,000 years thinking that freedom in Christ means freedom from rules. <laughs> And in a sense, that's exactly what Paul is saying. Freedom of Christ means freedom from rules, and yet, straight is still straight. And yet, law still points the right direction. And yet, these principles of God that have been established from the beginning of time are still true. And the reason that is important is that if we interpret freedom as Christ as freedom to do whatever we want, regardless of the consequences, it is as disastrous as if we take off the training wheels and think, now I can finally lean over as far as I want to. The freedom that is going to be developed throughout the rest of the book, freedom is a huge theme of Galatians. The freedom that's going to be developed throughout the rest of the book is not freedom to do whatever you want. It is freedom to be the person God meant you to be. It is freedom to live the life God intended humans to live. It is freedom to ride straight and upright on your bicycle without the help of the training wheels. And if we misunderstand that, we will mistake freedom, we will mistake our own sinfulness for freedom. And we will not only <laughs> crash our lives, but we will run the risk of crashing the lives of everyone we love in the name of Christian freedom, right? So I, I see this with Christians all the time, especially those of us who like to be really snobby and self-righteous about how much more we know than those old people who followed the law know, how few constraints are on our life. I talked to a woman once who was so proud of being freed in Christ and forgiven in Christ and none of those rules mean anything anymore and she screamed at her family every night until her husband finally left and there is no longer slave or free there is no longer male and female all of you are one in Christ Jesus and if you belong to Christ you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. The drastic turn that's happening in this book is that Paul is about to start describing what freedom looks like. So if the basic argument is that the law served a purpose while we were children, what he's saying is you're grown-ups now. You're grown-ups now. What does being grown-up look like? What does spiritual maturity look like? What does life in faith and life in the spirit look like? And this first thing, after he makes this turn, this first assertion that he makes is that the grown-up, mature, spiritually mature life in the faith in Jesus Christ is marked by a radical unity, unheard of across the rest of the face of the earth. And this line, in Christ, there is no more Jew or Greek. There is no more slave or free. There is no more male and female. You are one in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are all Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. Now, this first line starts out with, you are all children of God. And the Greek, that is actually the male, it's sons. It's translated children because... Um, it, grammatically, if you've got a mixed gender group of people, and if there's even one guy, you, translate, you use the masculine form of the verb, uh, of the noun for everyone, and so that's why they translate it children instead of sons. But what you lose in that translation is that in that culture, sons were the ones who inherited it. And so what Paul is saying is that you are all, because of what he says in the last sentence, you are all heirs, you are all heirs. You are all sons, not in the sense that you are all men, in the sense that you are all heirs. You are inheriting the promise, the future, the kingdom of God, and the reality formed by your sonship overrides the realities that you experience in the rest of your day-to-day -day life. And what Paul is fundamentally saying is this, the truth, there is, a, there is an existential truth once you are in Christ, that supersedes the truths that you experience around you. 
You walk in a world where you can walk down the street and you can see the divisions we've created, right? You walk in a world where you walk down the street and you can see the difference between Jew and Gentile. You could definitely see slave and free. You could see male and female. And what Paul is saying, spiritual maturity means that in Christ, you understand that there is an almost mystical reality whereby your unity with those people is more important than whatever superficial things divide you outside the church. And it doesn't mean that that unity means homogeneity. It doesn't mean that unity means that everyone agrees with each other. This letter is testament to the fact that they did not agree with each other. In fact, they did not agree with each other quite colorfully at times. That unity means that underneath the disagreements, underneath the differences, there is an understanding that the core truth of the universe is that in Christ, we are one. We are one. And whatever divisions may exist around us at a social level are fundamentally less important than that which has connected us and that which unites us. Because that which unites us is real and true. In the same way there is one bread, we are one body. And once we in, uh, pass through baptism into life, in Christ, we are connected beyond whatever divisions we might impose on ourselves and each other in the world outside. Now, this is possibly one of the most drastic verses of the entire New Testament. This is possibly one of the most over-preached and under-practiced verses of the entire New Testament. Because the truth of the matter is, this is one of those verses that it is easy to get very, very poetic about. But when it comes to the nuts and bolts of how to actually live it out in daily life, we struggle. Because we might not be Orthodox Jews wanting to draw a strict line between Jew and Gentile, but we get very uncomfortable when the lines that we have drawn between me and you get challenged by the gospel. And that line is different depending on who you are and how you were raised, but I've come to suspect that most humans have one, especially the ones who think they don't especially the ones who think they don't. I think perhaps there is something universal in human nature whereby we can only describe our identity by separating us from the people who are not us, which then when we need somebody to get mad at, when we need somebody to scapegoat, when we need somebody to blame, makes a very easy target for the people who are not like us. And the difficulty is, when those people then become our brothers and sisters in the faith and we share one body through faith in the baptism of Christ, this what has separated us is fundamentally on a spiritual level less real than what unites us. Because the real reality of the world is we are one. We are one in Christ. There is no more. Jew or Greek. There's no more male or female. There's no more slave nor free. There's no more whatever else you see in the world that sets up identities intended to divide us rather than unite us. I don't know of a church or a period in Christian history where we've practiced this well. <laughs> So I often at this point in the sermon give you an illustration from Christian history of like, yeah, these are the people that really got this. We struggle with this, y'all. We struggle with this. A whole lot. Because our identity is so firmly rooted in institutions that began outside of the church that once we come into the body and into the faith, we have a hard time letting go of how real we think those identities were. And that is particularly true of our age. And I'll tell you what, um, so yesterday, everyone knows, was the 20th anniversary of 
I was in college um, when I heard the news that the towers um, had fallen. I was, uh, had just gotten out from a philosophy class coming back, and, and someone caught me on the street and, and, and told me the news. And that, so my entire adult life has been marked by a memory, an idea of the United States as a place that is contentious within itself, as a place that is divisive within itself. And we have reached a moment where we are possibly the most div divisive and contentious that we've been, um, at least in my adult memory. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't like overstating things, and so I'm not going to say we're most divisive that we've been ever, because, like, there was a civil war back there. <laughs> there were, there were a whole, my dad reminds me often that there have been a whole lot worse times in history, which he, there, were, there have been a whole lot worse times in history. But whether or not that's true, it's, it's also true that, y'all, it's hard right now. It is rough. The forces that divide us are strong and they are loud. The forces that wish us to demonize other human beings are strong and they are loud. The forces that tell us that we cannot live together are strong and they are loud. And what makes me wonder if perhaps right now the witness needed from the Christian church is to prove that it is possible to love each other beyond the false gospel that tells us that we cannot. It makes me wonder if the witness necessary in this time, in this age, is none other than a Christian community that is willing to say, you and I are one in Christ. You and I are one in Christ, and we might not agree, and we might not be the same. We might be different identities, however you want to describe that. We might have lines in the sand between us, and yet because you are in Christ and I am in Christ, what we have in common is more important and more real than what divides us. And because of that, because of that, I will love you in a way that doesn't make sense to outsiders, in a way that doesn't make sense to people who are not in this body in a way that doesn't make sense but is grounded on an almost mystical reality that we are one. And that's hard to do. That's incredibly hard to do, which is why so few people try. Um, for those of you, I, if you are not familiar with Westminster, you know that we're in an odd duck. <laughs> there are churches that are entirely one kind of people and churches are entirely another kind of people and we're like no we're just gonna mix them all together um i will say it would have been a whole lot easier over the last two years if you guys had all agreed about everything that would have made my job that would have made my job so much more simple but you don't and because you don't we are walking this hard path in the gospel where we are saying you know what because we are in christ there is neither jew nor greek and what it is about you that separates you from me is fundamentally less important than the fact that we are both in Christ. And because we are both in Christ, even though it doesn't make sense, I will work for your benefit. I will love you. Because in Christ we are all one. That is a hard thing to do, and that's why so few churches try. And I'll tell you what, if you, like, if you came this morning, if you were looking for a church where everyone agrees with each other, I just don't think that's our thing. If you're looking for a church that's going to be, you know, <laughs> putting out, like, um, tables at political rallies of either one side or another, that's not our thing, because half of the people would be at different rallies, right? Like, we're, we're that group. We're that group that says, in a culture that says, it is more important to decide who's Jew and who's Gentile, we say no. It is more important that in Christ, it is possible to love each other. It is possible to live together. It is possible to show unity even over the differences. And it doesn't mean it's easy, but whoever said the gospel is easy. So I feel like this was not an upbeat sermon for this morning. But friends, it's an important one. The rest of the sermon, the rest of the series, the rest of these sermons, what he's going to do in the rest of this book is to tell us what spiritual maturity looks like. And he's going to go through several different um, uh, concepts. We're going to hear about the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to hear about all these different things about what spiritual maturity looks like. But what he starts with 
is this, spiritual maturity, being grown up, being in faith, means an ability and a willingness to live as though the oneness of the body of Christ were real because it is. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Almighty Heavenly Father, you have given us so much. You have poured yourself out. You have offered yourself to us. You have invited us. You have invited us beyond um, the identities we grew up with, beyond the identities that we find so meaningful in the world. You have invited us out of those identities and into you to find our being in you to find ourself in you, to find our identity in you, and to recognize that in you, we are all one. We are all drawn together. We are all made right. We are justified and invited, invited out of our sinfulness and into your grace. And so, Heavenly Father, in this time of division, give us peace. In this time of arrogance, give us humility. In this time of war, Give us the ability to love one another truly and deeply and honestly and humbly until the day comes when we all feast together in the great banquet hall of the new creation. Heavenly Father, come. Make us yours and make us one. This we pray as we say together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the point of our service that we call the offering. This is where, if you have a, 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 an offering, you can give it online. You can also give it at the box in the back. But for Westminster, offering is about more than money because you are more than money. You are time and talents and gifts and service. You are relationship. You are words. You are presence. You are everything. And God wants all of it. And so we give you two minutes to go in your heart of hearts and to consider what it means to give all of yourself back to the God who gave all of himself to you. what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow out remain steadfast and let my heart in you speak a word it will come to pass for great is your faithfulness 
to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same i will praise your name great is your faithfulness to But you remain, you remain the same. Oh God of ages and ages, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Yeah. Your history will prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. And though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. For great is your faithfulness to me. Yeah. Great is your faithfulness. To the setting, sing my will, praise your name. For great is your faithfulness to me. Your faithfulness, it remains the same and it never changes. I put my faith in you and in your I believe in the resurrection For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in miracles I believe in signs and wonders A few quick announcements before we enter time of worship this morning. You may be seated. Uh, we have lots of things coming up, y'all, and we need like one million volunteers. And so you have a choice. You can volunteer with the pumpkin patch or you can volunteer with the pumpkin patch 10 different times. Those are your choices. Um, we want you to go sign up to help us unload and then sign up for a shift. This is really easy, especially if you live nearby. Also, it's super fun. Um, this is, we have lots of people come by last year. I sat at the pumpkin patch for a couple hours and it was the most um, kind of productive conversations I've had with community members all year long. Uh, it was wonderful. It's you get to meet people, you get to just love on them and and be friendly. And pumpkins make everyone happy, so everyone's in a good mood when they come by. So the sign up. You go to wumc.com, click on our events page. That's where we've put all of our sign ups. Uh, the other thing that's coming up is at the very end of October, we're doing a Halloween extravaganza. Uh, this is going to be super fun. Our trunk or treat has grown. It has exploded. Uh, we have been very lucky to partner with Tinglewood Living, and so we're doing a, a whole lot of fun things because they're sponsoring some things that we would never have done otherwise. And so we're going to have a concert by our very own Encounter Band. Yay! We're going to have a concert by our very own Encounter Band, but we're also going to have a face painting and balloon artists. There's going to be a pet owner costume contest. Amazing. There's going to be a pumpkin costume con... No, no, that's not right. There's going to be a pumpkin contest. You can put the pumpkin in a costume if you want to. That would be cute. A pumpkin decorating contest. There's going to be the trunk or treat. There's going to be a contest for like the best decorated trunk. Um, it's just going to be a lot of fun and so much sugar and so much wonderful good times. Uh, good feelings held by all. And then you get to wake up the next morning and come to church because it's on a Saturday night. But it's going to be super fun. Uh, we need lots of volunteers for that too. So sign up for the pumpkin patch, sign up for the Halloween extravaganza, and go tell all of your friends. It's going to be a great time. I believe, are this another, is there another announcement up there? Wednesday night Bible studies. 
Yes, 7 p.m. Uh, we are doing that one by Zoom. And is there another? That is it. Year of service. I, so we are officially done collecting uh, cards for right now. But if you miss, if you still want to turn in your service card, you are welcome to. Basically, one of the, the new kind of normal that we are working ourselves into is every six months, we invite everyone to sign up for a service team serving somewhere in the church, either for as little as one hour a month or as many hours as you want to put in. And then six months later, we do it again. So if you want to change teams, you just check off a different box. That time you can. So we've officially ended kind of our collection period, but you are allowed to turn these in wherever. So if you want a card, they are on the back. And uh, this is something we're encouraging not only every adult, but like older kids are welcome to as also. I uh, welcome to as well. We've got a spot for you in the encounter band. Uh, anyone who wants to come, come serve. All right, friends, would you stand and receive these words of benediction as we depart this morning? My brothers and sisters, go in peace, go in hope, go in love, go in joy, and go in unity. Go knowing that what you have in Christ is greater than what comes against you in the world. Go knowing that who you are in Christ is more important than who the world says you are. And go knowing that your future in Christ is solid and secure and won by the blood of the Lamb. Go in the name and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.